The world changed forever in December of 1903 on the fields outside Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Just over a decade after the Wright brothers stunned the world, combat pilots like the Red Baron and Eddie Rickenbacker were capturing the imaginations of youths the world over as tales of their heroic, aerodynamic chivalry over the battlefields of France made them instant legends. After the war, young men such as Charles Lindbergh continued to whet the world's appetite for stories of humanity conquering the skies. When America went to war once again, young boys from all 48 states volunteered for service to, as one pilot wrote, slip the surly bonds of earth and touch the face of God. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the empire of Japan. Nobody was ready. We didn't know a thing was going on. We had no idea. The thing was diving over on top. We didn't know, I didn't know where that zero, that, that rising sun would meet. The guy who did something to save a buddy's life, that's a real hero. He's the only real hero. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Before I could turn around, all hell broke loose. It was flashes of fire all over. I thought we had been hit directly. I never heard anything. When I come to, I was halfway back to the hospital. Well, I was told that there was still another job that was up there. Almighty God, our sons, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. If anybody said that he went in war, he wasn't afraid, it's not true. Anybody was afraid. Don't know if he was going to make it or not. You don't think about killing, you don't think about dying, you don't think about your friend getting killed. Everything is a mystery. They teach you how to kill, but they don't teach you anything else after you come out. You don't know what to do. As the Allies began their invasion of North Africa in the fall of 1942, the need for a new air force to patrol the Mediterranean became apparent. After the Nazis were driven out of southern Italy, the 15th Air Force moved its base of operations north to the shores of the Italian peninsula. No German factory, refinery, or troop command in southern Europe was safe from the millions of pounds of bombs dropped from the heavy bombardment groups of the 15th. I didn't want to wait to be drafted and put in another infantry or tank corps or whatever. I uh, wanted to go in Air Corps. So I went in in uh, February the 22nd and uh, reported for duty on March the 1st. But I had specified I wanted to be Air Corps. You could have better facilities, especially when you're in combat. We were in lines far behind the enemy but our missions would carry us over enemy territory. But if we would complete the mission and get back, it would be a lot better living facilities and better e eating conditions and all that, and uh, to have to be in the infantry on the front lines. I was the radio operator and gunner. My radio operator room was right behind the bomb bay, right in the mid part of the B-17. My gun was a skylight gun on the top of the roof. One 50 caliber machine gun. They sent me to Shepherd Field, Texas from Camp Beauregard for basic training. I stayed there for three months, and then from there I went to radio operator school up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. From uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, they sent me to aerial gunnery school. So at Yuma, Arizona, learned all about the uh, machine guns, the 50 caliber machine guns. 
I went through two months of schooling there, and they sent me on a de delay en route from Yuma to Tampa, Florida, where I was going to be assigned to a permanent crew. And once you were assigned, you became a member of that one crew, and then we would be assigned to take our training as a crew aboard the B-17. We got to be so close to each other, like brothers. We all got to be like family. We were in Tampa flying these uh, training missions for, like I said, about three or four months during the summer of 43. We got a, a brand new B-17 in Savannah, Georgia. We flew that as a crew up to uh, Bangor, Maine, and we processed out all of our orders and things over a, a two or three day period. Then we flew from there to Goose Bay, Labrador, and then refueled in, in uh, Newfoundland, and then over to Iceland, the northern route. We flew that B, uh, brand new B-17 all the way over to England. After hours of training and combat flight, the fuselage of a B-17 became another home to her crew. Nose art quickly appeared on almost every aircraft in the United States Army Air Force. Sometimes crews would paint a popular cartoon character. Other times, the painting was patriotic. Quite often, however, crews would use a much more familiar metaphor. In Bugs Bunny, which our motto was, uh, our saying beats me, Doc, that was a Bugs Bunny saying. On our plane, the, um, as our uh, squadron, Mammy Yoakum, that was our mascot on, on the nose of the plane, delivering the knockout punch. In other words, we were delivering the knockout punch to Germany. She had the Kickapoo Joy Juice Knockout Punch. And uh, that was a, a very popular uh, cartoon in the newspapers in those days. Well, we thought we'd be members of the 8th Air Force since we had been sent to England. But evidently our orders were to go to, from England to Italy. We were in the 483rd Bombardment Group 817th Bombardment Squadron of the 15th Air Force in Italy. Our squadron had been hit hard on a previous mission a couple of months before we got there over Memmingen Airfield in Germany. They got hit and lost seven of the crews on that one mission. So when we got there in September, they were open arms to see us because they needed crews so badly. We flew our first mission on October the 4th to Munich, Germany. That was our target. It was uh, not too long a mission. It was about a six to eight hour mission over the Alps Mountains. I, I was flying from October the 4th to, uh, to November the 15th a little over a month, month and a half, I flew 15 missions. Now sometimes you can't fly because of the weather, either over our base or over the Alps or over the target. So you might spend a couple of days on the ground not flying. And so I flew 15 missions from October the 4th to November the 15th. At that time, they told us we were due for a rest camp leave, a seven-day leave. Some crews would go to the Isle of Capri off the coast of Italy. Others would go to Rome. Well, I was fortunate enough to go to Rome. Joe Peroni and I being Catholic, that meant a whole lot because we could go to the Vatican City and see all of these marvelous things I mean, you could go through the Sistine Chapel and the Vatican and even a, an audience with the Pope. He would, you know, have an open audience with a lot of people in a congregation, 
a lot of military people from our, you know, the United States military as well as other countries, from Britain and France and uh, other countries also that were involved in the uh, Allied operation. They had uh, military personnel. So anyway, we went to Rome and uh, we were uh, in the Vatican City. We visited for three days. And one time we had the audience when the Pope was there. It was Card Cardinal Pacelli, Pope Pius XII. And so after he gave his uh, greetings and talk and all of that is the uh, little message. You could go up and kneel and kiss the papal ring. And he would say, well, and where are you from in the United States? He knew we were American airmen. And I'd say, I'm from Louisiana. Uh, he's uh, south of New Orleans, a town south of New Orleans. Ah, he says, you're, you're with Archbishop Rummel. He knew the Archbishop of New Orleans. Diocese was Rummel right there. Ah, I say, yes, yes. A lot of air crews had moved in. Weather was bad. We couldn't fly sometimes for days at a time. So we had to take our turn, wait our turn. Might be a week or two before you'd get a mission. But I mean, finally, when I uh, got to be close to finishing my tour, I had written home to tell them not to write anymore to that address because by the time their letter would reach me, I would probably be finished and on my way home. In the morning before we would go on a mission, the bombardier, navigator, pilot, co-pilot, and radio operator, we were the five members that went to briefing. The others went out to the flight line to pre-flight the plane, get everything ready for the flight. Then we would meet them out there after the briefing. So they would get us up about four o'clock in the morning. We'd go to breakfast. It would call and say, hey, Chawa, that means this is time to get up. We would go to briefing, half of the crew, and the other half would go to the flight line. And at the briefing, they would say, in this big room, your target for the day. And then they would take the canopy off of the big map and it would tell us all about it and you'd either hear oh, oh you know if it was a rough target in previous missions <laughs> a lot of oars and oars but if it was one it was an easy mission ah okay mostly every mission almost the engineer gunner would go to the mess hall and pick up the uh, sa sandwiches at the mess hall uh, they were orange marmalade sandwiches, most of the time. And over that altitude, would sometimes be 32,500 feet up. And that uh, temperature up there is 60 below zero. So y your sandwiches would freeze. We come back down to get low enough to eat them, they were hard as rock, frozen. And always said, boy, if we can only get a chance to bomb that orange marmalade factory. To most Americans living in the States in the spring of 1945, Allied victory seemed inevitable. The German offensive in the Ardennes Forest had been pushed back. The Japanese had surrendered Iwo Jima, and Allied forces began pushing their way into Germany past the Siegfried Line. Troops on the front, however, knew the war was far from over. Bomber crews were still sent from their bases on a daily basis, and more and more young men were killed, wounded, or missing over German territory. When we went to briefing that day, and we saw the target for the day would be ruling our refinery, we all thought, well, maybe this is going to be another milk run, which we called an easy mission. It might be long, but all you had to do was go and deliver your bombs and come back, like the milkman delivering his milk on a route, you know. 
We call it a milk run. Well, the Germans were very good at being deceptive. They could have an easy target one day, and when you went back, that target was well fortified the next time, because they could figure you're going to come back there. Won't be today or tomorrow, but you're going to be there one day soon. So they did move a lot of the rail road anti-aircraft guns in around the target from other areas. They'd move a lot of the fighter planes close to the area, waiting. We took off and it was a long mission. Nine and you'd encounter little flak along the way at different areas. But over the target, usually that's where your anti-aircraft guns were more intense. And when they would get an air raid signal, a siren, the Germans, that the formation of planes were coming, then they would really concentrate on the area above that target and start shooting at you when you would come into range. Well, this time we were up there and I uh, had put on all of my flak suit, my vest and my helmet and oxygen mask on naturally. We had that on from the moment we got to 10,000 feet. I was in a position where I had to watch the bomb bays, the bomb bay doors. Bomb bay said, bomb bays are opening. I said, bomb bay doors are open. So we went from the IP on. As we got closer to the target, had aircraft fire. Black smoke, gray smoke. That was 88 millimeter cannons or 105 millimeter cannons exploding. Sometimes you'd hear the shrapnel coming through and you'd huddle more closely. All huddled up watching the bomb bay. Finally, when we got to the target, he said, bombs away. And I said, bomb bays are clear. And before I could turn around, all hell broke loose. It was flashes of, I don't know, fire all over. I thought we had been hit directly with one of the anti-aircraft shells that and I mean, I was peppered with shrapnel. And I got a few pieces in my hand and my face and all of that through my oxygen mask. It looked like we were losing altitude. So I said, radio to pilot, radio to pilot on the communications. No answer. I did that three or four times. Radio to pilot, radio to pilot. No answer. I said, everybody in the nose of the plane must be dead. If pilots have been hit or killed, the plane had to go down. So I looked in the back to the waste gunner, my waste gunner, Richard Josephson was bombing, motioning, come on, let's bail out, you know. So I guess we were losing altitude and we were getting down around 20,000. And uh, you're not supposed to bail out at that altitude, you're out of oxygen, you can have anoxia lack of oxygen, you're gonna pass out and, and die. I said, I know we gotta get to lower altitude before we bail out and open our chute. And uh, so he was motioning to me, come on, come on. So I grabbed the chute and I went to, back to the waist and he was getting ready to bail out and I was trying to put my chute on. And boy, I tell you, I guess we were down to maybe 15,000 feet. And uh, he went out the door waste door and then when I was hooking my shackles to the harness my parachute I was diving out the door at the same time I says I hope it's on and all of a sudden I pulled hard and it straightened me out pow you know from tumbling and the harness was caught I was coming down probably maybe 10 12,000 feet I looked down below me I could see all the formation of the planes going on in the distance. Fighters were still attacking. And I was watching my waist gunner that had bailed out right before me. He was below me. We get a little bit lower and I could hear bullets whizzing by. I said, uh-oh, they're shooting at us from the ground. They had a lot of civilian farmers in that area. 
And so I started working my trawl lines to make a pendulum, make a harder target. I was probably about 3,000 feet above, and I saw him land, hit the ground. The German civilian farmers were running out to him, and he didn't get up to move. And then the next thing I know, I'm really being carried by the wind over a forest, a lot of trees. So I come down through the treetops. My parachute got hung up in the top of the trees. My feet are about 15 feet from the ground. And there's some civilian farmers with their rifles. A risky, a risky. They thought I was a Russian paratroopers because we were close to the Russian mines. And boy, they hated the Russians. They didn't like them one bit. So I said, next risky, Americana. And just at that time, I was looking on the muzzle of those rifles. I figured one of them is going to pull the trigger. And that's it. But I heard voices, nine, nine, nicks. Three German soldiers in a little horse and buggy gig came up the road. We're telling them not to shoot. Nine, nicks, that means no. So they pulled up and they took control and they started talking, the soldiers and the German farmers and all of that. I couldn't understand what they were talking about. I didn't know how to speak German. The farmers went to this farmhouse not far away down the road. They came back with some axes. I said, what are they going to do? Kill me with the axes? You know, you're always thinking the worst. So finally, they started chopping the tree down. When they got the thing chopped down, the tree came and I came down with it. And I hit the ground hard with my leg and buckled my knees and it, it really did do some harm, hurt. I uh, was surrounded by German civilians, women, men, farmers in that area, children. The women started, ah, oh, the, the parachute, you know, that silk, boy, they could make some pretty dresses, wedding dresses and all. With that, they were figuring, I guess. And that was the least of my thoughts. So, so then the German soldier, the one that seemed to be the one in charge, he came to me and started, uh, they were all searching me. And I had so many layers of clothing on, like I say, at that altitude, we always had a lot of clothing for the cold. So they, they searched me and out, they took my 45 pistol away I had in my belt. Ah, pistol, yeah, yeah, okay. They took it. And then I couldn't under make them understand anything. I was pointing inside of my jacket in my shirt pocket. I wanted them to look there. I had the identification that were given to us with all of the uh, languages that if we were shot down over enemy territory, we would be interned as prisoners of war. If we were shot down in friendly territory, they would try to get us back to our uh, American lines. If it was a neutral country, they would intern us for the duration of the war. So uh, all of that was uh, written on there as, as an American airman. Finally, I went so slow, I didn't want to give them any indication I was going for another gun. I went and I pulled it out and I gave it to the uh, soldier. Ah, he started drinking, Americana, Americana. And then so after that, I had my missile in my flight coverall pocket on my knee. So I kept, they went down and searched. Oh, he pulled a missile, oh, Catholic? I, yeah, I pointed to him, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I got a friend I think I don't think he's going to kill me now. I don't think uh, one Catholic to another would do that. Whenever a soldier was declared killed or missing in action, 
the U.S. government sent a Western Union telegram home to the family of the soldier in question. The messages were short and often unclear, but concern always followed their delivery. It could be argued the most feared man in America during World War II was the one delivering the Western Union telegram. They brought us into a little jail. They had different cells. We put one of us in each cell. In that cell there was a bunk with like straw and hay and all of that for the mattress. And I figured this is a dream. I'm going to wake up. Can't be. I still had my missile. And it has the address of my parents on the inside cover. And I scratched it out so the Germans wouldn't be able to use that to write to my parents at their home address to tell them some bad news, maybe. Because they used to do that. They didn't want you to give them an address so I have any access to your address. So a name, rank, and serial number is all you were supposed to give them. And that's all I gave them. About 12 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, they knock on, Rouse, they came over, unlock the door. Knocking on the door, Rouse, Rouse, get up, get up, that man. In German, we said, let's go. So we walk out of the cell and everybody that had been picked up, we were all there in that little hallway with the German guards and uh, we couldn't talk. They had uh, to put us in a, way on a canvas back truck, a German uh, military truck was waiting outside in jail. So they had two guards sitting on the back of each end of the truck in the back and made us get into the truck. So as I got in, I saw some clothing on the floor of the truck, a jacket that I recognized as my waist gunner that had bailed out below me, and it had blood on it, and it looked like a bullet hole. And I pointed to the jacket, and I asked the guard, what, what, you know, to try to make him tell me what happened. Ah, Nix, kaput, he didn't raise his hands, you know, Nix, he didn't raise his hands. Kaput, he's dead. That's what that meant. Kaput, dead. Finally, they said, we're going to put you in formation and march you to the train station. Stalag Luft I was built near the North Sea outside the city of Barth, Germany. As German soldiers marched Allied prisoners down the streets of Barth to the prison camp, the people of the town would greet their guests with shouts and insults. Many a rock or spitball was accompanied by cries of terror flieger or assassin. We had SS troops surround us. We had two old German soldiers. They were guarding us to bring us to the prison camp up in uh, Barth, Germany, Stalag Luft I. 24 men to build a room, and not much you can do, not much food to eat. And that's where I ended up for the next few months. Colonel Gillespie and Colonel Zemke were the two senior officers that were prisoners fighter pilots that had been shot down. We'd fall out in the morning, be counted. We'd fall out in the afternoon before they locked us in and count us up. They were locked in these buildings, German dogs, German shepherds patrolling the compound, guard towers on every corner and in between, and we didn't have much food. The Red Cross would send parcels with things in cigarettes and uh, cans of powdered milk, little uh, D-bar, candy, uh, chocolate bar, uh, things like that. The Germans were not giving us all of the Red Cross parcels. They were holding back and they were probably taking some for themselves. They didn't have much to eat themselves, the Germans at that time. They had been at war so long, they had hardly nothing left. We. Uh, survived by the hardest. We were not made to work. We were all officers or non-commissioned officers. The Germans would make the 
Russian prisoners or French prisoners do most of the work. Americans, we didn't have to do any labor. We were liberated by the Russian troops. They were coming up along the coast of northern Germany, and uh, they overran our prison camp, and they wanted us to move out because they had confiscated that property. So finally they had a Russian officer that he could talk a little English, and he allowed us to wait to be evacuated by Eighth Air Force. When we were liberated, we couldn't go anywhere until we were flown out. The Russians provided us with some entertainment, and they went out and slaughtered a few cattle and brought some meat in. We each had one little steak while we were waiting for the Eighth Air Force to come and bring us out. And they would have a band, they would play their Russian folk music and all, and dance, you know, they kicked their feet. And they had their musical instruments on one and their machine guns on the other. After they play, they put it on, pick up their, you better applaud. <laughs> Quite often, the whereabouts of a prisoner's air crew were unknown to him during the duration of his stay at Stalag Luft I. After the Russians liberated the camp in May of 1945, airmen were finally able to try to relocate their lost comrades. Unbeknownst to us, the pilot and co-pilot, bombardier and navigator in the front were able to keep flying. What had happened? Everything, the communication system was out, intercom. That's why I couldn't reach the pilot and co-pilot to get a message to find out what was going on. And the oxygen system was out. So you have to get to lower altitude. The navigator and bombardier bailed out after we did. You had the pilot and co-pilot, ball turret gunner and the uh, tail gunner made it behind the Russian lines and landed, but it took them about two months before they could get back to our base in Italy. But then the war had ended, and when we had that direct hit of, after we dropped the bombs, I heard somebody scream. I thought that was everybody in the front that had gotten killed, maybe, that the whole front end of the plane might have been blown away. But that was Joe Peroni in his upper turret gun had got hit by a 40, uh, 20 millimeter cannon exploded in his turret and just blew him open. So what they did when they were throwing everything out, they didn't know if they were gonna make it themselves. They had a harness and they put the chute on him and they put the shroud line where it would automatically pull the chute open and threw him out of the bomb bay so that the civilians on the ground, somebody could find him. And uh, his body was later return to the States. The German people are good people, very intelligent, highly civilized, and highly skilled. What happened to Germany was an ambitious guy like Adolf Hitler got control of the country as a dictator and forced them into that kind of situation. Not all Germans wanted that kind of life. They didn't want to, I mean, be at war. They had gone through that in World War I. And here they were going through it again in World War II. When you're young, you're ready to do anything that's necessary. You don't have the fear of what might happen to you. You have a lot of confidence in what you're going to do that's going to be the right thing. And you want to go there and kick the heck out of your enemies that caused all the misery, whether it be Japan or Germany. I was fortunate in a way. Two of my crew members were killed that day. We got shot down. Joe Peroni, my top turret gunner, and Joe, Richard Josephson, my waist gunner, very close, like losing a brother. 
On November 10, 1775, the Continental Congress formed a new branch of service to assist the Continental Navy in its land operations. Tun Tavern in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania became the first recruiting station for what would eventually become the United States Marine Corps. Less than a century later, the Marines distinguished themselves during the Mexican War by taking Chapultepec Palace near Mexico City. During World War I, the Marines once again earned fame at the Battle of Baloo Wood where they earned the nickname Devil Dogs. Perhaps its crowning glory, however, was sealed in blood on the beaches of hundreds of islands in the Pacific. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Nobody was ready. We didn't know a thing was going on. We had no idea. The plane was diving over on top. We didn't know, I didn't know what that zero, that, that rising sun would meet. The guy who did something to save a buddy's life, that's a real hero. He's the only real hero. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. Hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Before I could turn around, all hell broke loose. It was flashes of fire all over. I thought we had been hit directly. I never heard anything. When I come to, I was halfway back to the hospital. Well, I was told that there was still another job that was up there. Almighty God, our sons, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. If anybody said that he went in war, he wasn't afraid, it's not true. Anybody was afraid. Don't know if he was gonna make it or not. You don't think about killing, you don't think about dying, you don't think about your friend getting killed. Everything is a mystery. They teach you how to kill, but they don't teach you anything else after you come out. You don't know what to do. When the Japs attacked Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, I was living in, on a rather street in New Orleans. And uh, my brother had been drafted into the services already, and he was in the Navy. So when I turned 17, I wanted to volunteer, and I was going to volunteer in the Navy. Well, my mother wouldn't hear about it. Said I was going to have to wait until I was 18, until I was going to be drafted. But in the meantime, there's a movie that came on with John Wayne from the halls of Montezuma. Well, I went. And when I seen all those Marines, but I got in those dress blues and everything, oh, there was no way that I could be a swabby. We uh, went and I got sworn in, and uh, believe it or not, they gave me a 14-day liberty, by God, after I got sworn in. Caught the train in New Orleans at midnight and we headed west to, uh, to San Diego through the beautiful sandy lands of Texas and, uh, and Arizona and Nevada. Got into boot camp. Well, went all through boot camp and everything and went to the rifle range and come back. And uh, there's one story in there at boot camp one afternoon, one evening. At roll call, well, I hadn't started smoking too long, but anyway, uh, being Bellinger, well, hell, I was one of the first ones to call, and I'm standing in line and uh, bringing up the rear, always on the on the end, being such a small man. And I dug in my pocket, took a cigarette out, and put it in my mouth and st struck my zippo. Ah! Well, that sergeant by a guy, he says, Bellinger, I want to see you in my hut after roll call with your bucket. With my bucket? What the hell you want my bucket for? Well, after roll call, I did such. I went back and got my bucket and everything and uh, went into his, uh, to his hut. 
Mr. Ballinger, he says, you like to smoke, don't you? I said, sorry, it was done unintentionally. Well, he says, I'll tell you what, seeing that you like to smoke so much, he says, take another cigarette, light it up, take that bucket, put it over your head, and I don't want to stop seeing smoke coming out from under it. Well, sir, I didn't bring my cigarettes with me. No? Take one out of that pack, and it so happens he was smoking Picayune cigarettes. Well, I did, and I will vouch that this cat ain't never smoked in line again, okay? <laughs> Marine recruits were stacked into ships and sailed out of San Diego for Hawaii throughout the Pacific Campaign. Living conditions were far from comfortable, as Marines were stacked five high in hammocks in cramped living spaces. Woe to the man in the bottom bunk if the men above him were susceptible to seasickness. We left to go to Hawaii, and it was on a uh, aircraft carrier, the USS Langley. We were four Marines to every sailor on board, and uh, they were carrying a bunch of uh, little airplanes to Hawaii, to the Pacific uh, area. And well, when we left, I sat on the back end of that aircraft carrier, and there was old, maybe about the seven to eight foot ground, Pacific ground swell. And I was looking at the skyline of San Diego and just going slowly up and down, up and down, and all at once I start feeling my stomach wanting to come up. Hmm. And I'd never gotten seasick in my life. I'd worked with Daddy on, on the shrimp boats and everything, and uh, never did. My bunk happened to have been all the way down to the bottom by the forecastle, and it was hot down there. Well, and I, I could feel my stomach being upset all the time. Well, I made it through the night there, and then the next morning at Child, which was a Wednesday morning, and uh, in the Navy on Wednesday and Saturday for breakfast, you get red beans. Well, I went to Chow. I got served, I sat down at the uh, table, I took one bite, and when I did, it said, I'm here. Well, thankfully, the first hatch that I opened was under the flight deck in, in a gun turret. Well, I was able to get over the, the edge, and I heaved everything that I had eaten for the last two weeks if I still had anything left. And I found, I found one of the airplanes that had one of the doors that, that wasn't locked. Well, come nightfall, well, I snuck into that little booger and uh, I slept. Next morning, got up, went down to Chow, come back up, well, come back and I spent my, my time there on the flight deck the majority of the time. Then that night there, well, I found that same plane and I got in, well, there was another one of the Marines, I mean, it, that was uh, on patrol, and he spotted me, and he come and he got me out of there and said, hey, fella, he said, there ain't no way that you can sleep in these planes. He said, get out there and go down to your bunk. Well, it so happened that during the course of the day, I had spotted a life raft that was hanging under the flight deck. Well, I found that son of a gun. And that's where I spent the rest of my trip all the way to Oahu. Island hopping was a strategy devised and employed by the Allies in the Pacific Theater of Operations. The Marines would skip or hop over certain heavily defended islands and seize lesser defended areas that could serve the same strategic purpose. The Navy would then blockade the surrounding islands with submarine and air attacks stopping the Japanese from assaulting, while rendering the Rising Sun military ineffective in halting an advancement toward Japan. By the summer of 1944, the Marines were forcing their way through the Pacific toward the Japanese archipelago. The Corps had already seized a foothold on the Solomon and Gilbert Island chains, fighting hard battles at Guadalcanal and Tarawa, among others. Eager to gain an airstrip within bombing range of Tokyo, the military brass drafted a plan for the invasion of the Marianas Islands. When we got to Hawaii is when 
I made up with my, what I, what I always call my foxhole buddy by the name of Thad R. Boyd. He was 29 years old and held the majority of us, a 18, 19 year old. So we all called him Gramps. Well, from that time on, any time that I got transferred, or that old boy had got transferred with me. And uh, so we, we became like, like two brothers. I mean, we were, we were just as close as, to, as, as two brothers. We were replacements for the brothers that had been lost on Tarawa. At the end of May, we make an ever bit of eight knots, taking off for, uh, for Saipan. The 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions led the assault on Saipan on June 15, 1944. By nightfall on the first day, the Marines had gained a foothold on the island. The next day, the Army's 27th Infantry Division took as Lido Airfield, forcing the Japanese further into the mountainous terrain of the island. The Japanese commander, knowing defeat was inevitable, ordered his troops onto Mount Tapachio in the center of the island. Fighting was fierce as areas around the mountain earned names like Hell's Pocket, Death Valley, and Purple Heart Ridge. That morning we got ham and eggs for breakfast. But we, we boarded the Amtraks, and I was in the, in the third wave. In the second wave was a, uh, an engine that had been on Tarawa that uh, gotten the uh, Silver Star for some of the Worked some of the duties that he had done, getting the Japs out of these foxholes and everything, and pillboxes and all. Which to us, he was he was a hero. Well, hell, the the Japs are up on top of Mount Tapacho with their artillery uh, guns and everything, and uh, firing on firing on us as we were going in. Well, it didn't hit the uh, the Amtrak that this uh, engine was in. But evidently he, he cracked up and uh, there's no way, he just, he just jumped overboard. We hit the beach there at 800 at, at a Fetna point, I'll never forget it. Got on the beach, we started getting some sniper fire. Well, it didn't take long to get our naval ships to get rid of that little smokestack. You know. You've got to remember that every third bullet is a tracer. That's a bullet that has fire coming out of it. Well, you'd looked into that area. All you could see was a wall of fire. So D plus three, we bivouacked right next to the 10th Marines Artillery Battalion. The Japs, the Artillery Battalion on top of Mount Tapacho, and our 10th Marines there, they start throwing bullets back at each other. But like I say, uh, oh hell, I wasn't, I wasn't 25 yards from the side of the uh, battalion, you could hear those, sh those shells coming in and exploding. And I heard this one come in. And when it hit the ground, well, my foxhole literally vibrated. And uh, I was just waiting for it to, to explode. Well, the next morning when we got up, thank the good Lord, it was a dud. Well, they had decided that they were going to stay, that they were going to bivouac there for the rest of the night. Now you can envision trying to make a foxhole on the side of a mountain. Well, finding some little rocks, and that's when I come back and just with, with Boyd, I meet up with Boyd, and he trying to make the make that uh, that foxhole, like I said. Well, then uh, I'm starting to help him, and uh, I never heard anything. When I come to, I was halfway back to the hospital. And what I was told by Boyd was that there was still another job that was up there. And it happened to have a, a, a rock on the ledge. And it happened to be right where we were digging our foxhole. And he rolled it down and thankfully it hit the ground before it hit me. But when it rolled on to me, knocked me forward, I hit my head on, on one of the rocks that we were building for the foxhole there, and uh, it knocked me out. I was halfway back to the hospital before I come to. 
Towards the end of the battle for Saipan, Japanese commander Yoshitsugu Saito rallied his troops and civilians to form one last fatal bonsai charge on the encroaching Marines. There is no longer any distinction between civilians and troops, Saito said. It would be better for them to join in the attack with bamboo spears than be captured. Saipan was pronounced secure on July 9, 1944. Almost all the Japanese garrison was lost defending the island. For the Americans, the battle was the costliest to date in the Pacific, amassing over 14,000 Allied fatalities. More than 5,000 Japanese civilians committed suicide on Saipan, jumping into the ocean from places named Banzai Cliff and Suicide Ridge. Efforts by the American troops to force the Japanese into surrender were mostly futile, as Japanese propaganda convinced its citizens to believe the Americans and British would treat all prisoners brutally. As a result of the humiliating defeat on the island, Japanese Prime Minister Hideki Tojo was relieved of command of the Imperial Japanese Army. Less than a week later, he and his entire cabinet resigned from power. Stayed there seven days in the hospital. But on the way up there, I can recall the hill of bodies, Japs and Marines, that were stacked up Oh, a good eight, ten foot high, and I'd say a good, uh, oh hell, 25, 30 feet in circumference, a stack of bodies, which again is a sight that I'll never forget. Well, after we secured the island and we, we rested a, a, a few days there, and then went on into uh, the Tinian, well, the 4th Division made the landing up at the uh, Bada City on the southern end of the, of the, the island of Tinian, and we made the landing on the northern end of Tinian. Less than three weeks after the costly victory on Saipan, the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions assaulted the island of Tinian. The Japanese garrison was much smaller than on Saipan, but the philosophy of the rising sun was to fight until the last man fell. Heavy fighting ensued for roughly a week, and Tinian was pronounced secure on August 1st, 1944. We landed with no problem there, none whatsoever. And this was right by the, the airport. I found something that really amazed me. I found a baseball bat with Babe Root's name on it. And at the time, I knew that this had to be a, a, a treasure of treasures, for me anyway. But a baseball bat, uh, I lost my, uh, there, there was no way that I could put it in my uh, knapsack or anything, so I wasn't able to pick it up. But when we took off from there, there was a, a big pine tree, little pine tree grove, pine grove, that uh, on the side of the airport toward the island of Saipan. Well, me being the scout, well, they directed me to go and see if there was any Japs or anything in there or on the other side. Well, it was, oh, maybe uh, seven, eight hundred yards. Well, I walked across there, walked, walked through there, and then, thankfully, and, and there again, never, never realizing by myself if there's any Japs or anything in there, look, hey, you know. But no one was there, and I came back and reported to the, uh, to the squad leader. He says, fine. So then we started off marching. And that's when uh, I realized that I couldn't keep up with, the, with my back pain. Well, they sent me back to the hospital on Saipan, and uh, but never taking any x-rays or anything. Then from the hospital is when they sent me on the hospital ship uh, relief, and from there they sent me to, uh, to Hawaii.
Early in the morning on August 6, 1945, Colonel Paul Tibbetts and his crew boarded their B-29 and flew from the island of Tinian toward the Japanese archipelago. Their bomb payload that morning was a single piece of ordnance codenamed Little Boy. It wasn't until the Enola Gay was airborne that Colonel Tibbetts could finally reveal the details of the top secret mission to his crew. At roughly 8.15 a.m., the world entered a new age as the rising sun of Japan was eclipsed by 16 kilotons of human invention. The, the first thought that came to my mind when I heard about the atomic bomb was to realize the American lives that we had saved. Because had we had, had, we had to hit the islands of Japan, Hey, God knows how many American lives we'd have lost. I was married, and it was exactly one year to the day when I passed under the Golden Gate Bridge when the war stopped. September the 2nd. 1945. Three days after the Enola Gay dropped her atomic payload on the city of Hiroshima, Captain Frederick Bach flew his boxcar over the Japanese islands and dropped another atomic wonder weapon on the city of Nagasaki. On August 15, 1945, after more than a decade of atrocities and aggression, Emperor Hirohito ordered the unconditional surrender of all Imperial Japanese forces. On September 2nd, on the deck of the USS Missouri, the Japanese officially surrendered to the Allied forces. World War II was finally over at a cost of over 72 million lives worldwide. A while back, I was in with a uh veterans uh, group, and it was, the majority of them were from the European theater. And someone in the group asked what was the most beautiful sight that they had ever seen. Well, quite a few of them say, hey, that's not hard to describe. He said, the Statue of Liberty was the prettiest sight that we've ever seen. Evidently, I must have been the only one from the Pacific that was there. So I couldn't let that pass. So let me tell you one thing, guys. I know what y'all are saying, and I can understand and appreciate what y'all are saying. But I don't never think for one minute that that Golden Gate Bridge is not as pretty as that Statue of Liberty, buddy. <laughs> I said, that, that is a beautiful sight on the Pacific side. Hey, and I spotted that son of a gun about 8 o'clock in the morning. Just the top of it I could see. And it was 12 o'clock before we could get under there. That is an experience that I will never forget that I'll treasure for the rest of my life. He, the Japs had, uh, had offended us and, we, and we, we needed to defend each other, defend ourselves. And uh, yes, we, we were going to Tokyo. But because of what happened to me, I didn't get a chance to, to go to Hiroshima or anything, but uh, we did our job anyway. In, in all honesty, I've got pride. I've got to say pride for the Marine Corps. That, 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 that's the top, and they, simply for Dallas, always faithful to the Corps. And once a Marine, always a Marine.